Apollo 11 flight, which was basically to commemorate the uh, moon landing um, back when I was this big and wasn't sure what was going on. Um, I thought I should fly something, and then uh, a guy from Raspberry Pi magazine uh, emailed me and said, Dave, are you doing anything for Apollo? We were doing a special in the magazine. So we had a chat and agreed to do something. Um, and then he didn't turn up, but anyway, it was a good flight anyway. So the plan was to fly something. Um, and we've all done the te teddy bears and plastic to uh, toys and everything else. Um, but uh, something a bit special, hopefully. So I remember this from when I was, no, I think I remember watching it live before in the morning, I'm not quite sure. But uh, anyway, so I looked, looked around and found this kit, which uh, Ravel did. They, they did back uh, in the day and they've re released it this year uh, because of the, uh, the anniversary. Um, and it's about 15 quid, so I'll be back. Uh, and it came with all this stuff, which reminded me about you know, using Airfix kits when I was a kid, um, back when glue was for gluing things instead of sniffing. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and lots of little bits like this. I'm not sure why they gave me an astronaut to put inside the capsule, which you can't see when you build it. But uh, I think the idea is you can build it in different configurations. Uh, and I did uh, look at what configuration would the spacecraft have been above the Earth? And um, um, the answer is all hidden inside the rocket, basically. Um, but uh, on Apollo 9, I think it was, they did the docking maneuver um, in orbit around the Earth. So you would, if, they, if NASA had bothered putting another spacecraft up to the it, they'd have had the, the was I've captured in this flight. Um, anyway, there's a lot of painting. I discovered uh, that my eyes, which have got basically a focal length from here to here, are good for something, <laughs> which, which is painting into models. So it took quite a while. That's the, uh, the capsule, which they came back down in. Um, looks quite nice. Um, all of those little, little windows, they give you little bits of plastic to put in them. I mean, I, I read the whole, whole uh, you know, 10 yards of them built all of it, um, but you wouldn't really notice. <coughs> and that's the uh, service module, um, and you've even got microwave dishes on the end. Yeah, so it's quite a detailed little kit. Uh, and then you've got the uh, landing stage um, and the moon module, that's the blue. Um, and then this bit, and you can, you don't have to glue the whole lot together, but I did. I made that, which is, and it's been up into near space now. Um, I put a lot of thought into it. I mean, when I made it, that's actually not quite straight, so I oriented it that way with the camera here, so that all, all, all the parts would be roughly the same length from the, the lens. And there was quite a lot of thought uh, behind it. There's one of those in the Science Museum, and I had a look uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's not built as well as this one. <laughs> and it hasn't been to space. And it hasn't been to space, perfect. Or near space. Or no. Near space. I, I stood there photographing and wanted to tell everyone, I've got one of those in. It's worth mentioning this bit here, that's carbon fiber rod, two millimeter thick. Um, and again, if you, you can't really quite tell, there's a bit of plastic just behind it. So the idea, the camera was this end. Um, so that join there was hidden behind the top of the curve of the capsule. So just, you know, I had plenty of time to figure, figure this up out. Too much time. Too much time, <laughs> possibly. So having, having built that, with the vague idea of putting camera in front of it and flying it, um, and that was weeks before the, uh, the flight, so what else can I do? So I remembered this, and I'd love to have been working in there, apart from you wouldn't see anything because the cigarette smoke, um, and I'd have cancer by now. But apart from that, um, I'd love to have been involved um, in all this stuff. So I don't know if anyone remembers my Telnet flight, which I talked about last year, I think, um, and I did a mission control uh, emulation then. Um, so I basically took the same thing um, and then stretched it a bit, removed the rounded corners because they looked a bit rubbish when we put the video inside, um, and built this. So that one there has got, uh, this is a YouTube feed into the middle. Um, these are buttons. They're a bit crummy that I ran out of time on that one. Um, and this is actual telemetry from the flight. Um, yeah, that's a cheat actually, <laughs> I think, because that's not 
the altitude there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's live, that would be live telemetry. I'm not sure if I... Oh, maybe I played that back or something. I'm not sure. Probably. Um, oh, yeah. So first off, is that's all black and white. So how do you do black and white streaming to YouTube? So what I have is a Raspberry Pi Zero and a wide angle camera. And then this little um, script that gets uh, automatically started. Um, and this bit here is what makes it black and white. So you set the color saturation to zero. And then FFmpeg uh, streams to YouTube on that channel. And that just gets filled in um, when the script gets started. So then you, then you can stream in black and white. And I spent more time doing making this thing in black and white than any other particular aspect of it. Um, that's the SSDB, but this is faked because uh, SSDB, uh, I just used a regular page that uh, Phil uh, produces. Um, for this, I just cut and pasted a picture from the, uh, the SD card after the flight. But, uh, so it looks a bit better than it really did. Um, and that's, uh, I, I launched it uh, from us on Y in Hertfordshire, that's the uh, server mystery crystal channel down there. Um, and again, the SSDB is in black and white, so how does that work? Um, you just, in the this is a pie in the sky around, and that's, you just set camera settings to that. <coughs> so that sells Raspberry Steel, which is the high um, uh, still picture uh, program, uh, those settings, and that makes that work in black, black and white as well. So, um, oh yeah, so the data, this telemetry up here, um, I could have just got it from, uh, from HAPUB, so I could have just really had the script you know, getting data from there, or spa space near is a bit quicker, but anyway. Um, what I did was use, I've got my own server, so this is like a, um, a toy version of what uh, Darkside was uh, um, uh, talking about earlier for the, uh, for the radio songs. Um, this is running on AWS, it's basically a Linux machine in the internet somewhere, it cost me about a dollar a month or something, oh, something like that. And I wrote that uh, for another flight, which I've still not done which is basically where Phil and I are going to have a chat via two balloons. So he's going to see in Northern Ireland, type hello Dave, he's going to go up to the first balloon, echo to the second, handshakes and retries and all that jazz, and then down to me. Um, and what I want to do is have a dashboard that shows all those messages bouncing around in real time. And there's no way I could do that with uh, PAPA, because it doesn't respond quickly enough. Um, so the idea is I've got my own server here, um, all the telemetry, including those key types, um, key presses is sent from the gateway. So those of you who helped uh, track this flight, where you did enable have, have link equals yes, you were just enabling that, and that's a socket connection from your gateway up to the server. So all the telemetry you received went up there, and also some metadata, but don't worry, it's only your IP address and your call sign. <laughs> that's it. Um, and then that gets fed down to the dashboard here, um, has a web socket, so that's basically it's like a socket but over HTTP, um, and all of the telemetry for selected flights. So when this starts up, it sends a message up here saying to the server, "I'm interested in the flight called Apollo, um, or the list of the list of payloads that it's interested in." And then every time there's a new message from the balloon, that gets up there, and also the, there may be li several listeners, so they get uh, um, it just used to use the bit once, and then send it down uh, look straight away. So basically the delay between uh, telemetry being received from the balloon and appearing on the dashboard is uh, you know, way less than a second. That's how that works. Less than 30 minutes. Less than, yes. <laughs> the other reason I used this is because that was when HubHub was 30 minutes behind on a flight, which was just, it was useless basically. Anyway, that, that's all fixed. Um, if anyone's interested, that's written in C. Um, this is written in Delphi, which is Object Pascal, which is just the thing I use commercially mostly, so I'm familiar with it. And the nice thing is it's cross-platform, so you can write for um, Android, uh, Mac, PC, um, iPads, um, and Linux uh, uh, command line programs. And now you can do graphics on that as well. So that, that's just a uh, Delphi program receiving the data. And and this is weird. The dashboard is written in Delphi as well, and it's cross compiled from Delphi into JavaScript. So when you load up that page, you get a load of HTML, bits, uh, CSS, and a load of JavaScript comes down to your, your browser uh, to run um, 
run all that stuff there. So I know no JavaScript, and I'll show you some in a minute, I don't understand it, but, uh, um, because I did uh, Delphi all the way through. So that's how that worked. Um, and so yes, all this data here gets filled in from, from that feed. Um, this is a Google map, it's not space near us, it's just a Google map uh, using my API key, um, and that position is filled in and, um, from the telemetry. So uh, it's not reliant on space near, for the same reason as earlier. Next. Um, and the reason that's in grey, and you can make space near us in grey this exactly the same way, because I've tried it, um, and you just set this style, um, you just set grey to grayscale, and it makes everything in that window there grayscale. So I wouldn't want anything in colour that was in that, that area, because they had, with NASA, NASA just had grayscale displays. Uh, the next, uh, the next screen there is three D. So what I had a play with uh, a while ago was doing um, a, like a Google Earth live during the flight and embedded in the window here. And uh, when I searched for that, I found a thing called cesium. Um, it's just it says cesium there, just about, um, and which is um, an online map where you just want some JavaScript in your browser, um, and then you load up a, a, um, a window, um, and then you can set where it is, you can set um, all sorts of parameters, um, and live feed, and, make, and that's the, the view for an A flight, or one of Steve's flights that you kind of gave me the uh, enemy, enemy A for a while back. So all I'm doing there is, every few seconds, it updates the position from the playback telemetry for Steve's flight, and it just gently rotates it 360 degrees. So it goes right through to land, then, does that? Yeah, yeah, I've done it from, yeah, it looks a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on here, you've got all these, you've got controls as well, and you can mess around, but um, in the code, uh, yeah. uh, and that's the, that's the only JavaScript you need to load a window like that. Um, so most of that is turning off all the clutter on the screen I didn't want. Um, so mode pickers and full screen button. So it just turns all that off. And the only thing that's left is the Cesium logo. I don't think you can turn that off. Um, unless you pay for it. I didn't do that. Um, and I wanted that in black and white as well. You see the video just now was in colour. So I thought, okay, it's going to be called grayscale. And I may have some misspelled grey that American way. Uh, or it's called mono. No, it's called black and white. So <laughs> that took a while to find, but basically you just set this uh, post-processing thing. All that, <laughs> I believe, happens on the server, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, um, you just set this thing, and, and then you get a really blocky, uh, I think it's four, five, six levels of grey, um, and then you have to find this magic, which is set it to two typically six grayscales, and then you get um, the, the, a grayscale version of the, of the uh, the colour rendering. Um, so that window there, that, that code there just creates it. And then the second bit here, there's a routine called fly to. So this is written, this is, it looks a bit clunky. That's in Delphi. And that's just converting um, degrees to radians. Um, and then this bit here, ASM. Traditionally with Delphi, when, um, if you want, wanted to write assembly mm -hmm. language, which back in the, the days you, do, you did, you just bracketed it with ASM and N. And they've used the same <coughs> same idea to embed JavaScript. So that's direct JavaScript in the Delphi wrapper, if you like. So I, I do this, and I've, I've, made, I've got a module um, which has got all the uh, season routines that I use, um, which is only like two or three. Um, uh, so the rest of the program's in Delphi, that's in Delphi, and then just that bit is setting longitude, latitude, altitude. And then you can set you can set head heading pitch and roll. And if you're sensible, and I did try, but you only really want to do the heading. You don't want to do this stuff, because which is what Google balloons do. But then the, the viewer might not might need to uh, go to the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, next screen there telemetry. So this is um, I, I ran three trackers during the flight. Uh, two landing prediction, which Steve and I will talk about uh, next. Um, and 
that's basic telemetry for each one. And that's the latest telemetry received from any of the listeners that were, that were listening at the time. That's that one. Uh, the stat screen, um, I didn't realise how many receivers and it, it scrolled off the bottom and then looked rubbish. <laughs> but I did have to, there was, there, were, there was a bug or two in the server and I had to reset it a couple of times, so I think this after reset. So these are the listeners. So it, this information came in the um, metadata that got sent from your gateways um, and then how many of each um, uh, tracker that you received to, um, at that point. Uh, yes, that's it. So that wasn't enough. So I, th I thought, the consoles, can I, how, how more retro can I get? So I added in this stuff. Uh, okay, that's it. Yeah, I'm actually, can, can we get a sound? <laughs> there were Quindar tones as well on this stuff. So that that um, that uh, interference kind of, you know, not locked to, you know, not synchronized to the signal, uh, that was just a GIF that I just stretched over the top. So when you press the button, you turn the GIF on for a couple of seconds and then turn it up again. Okay. Let's again. Oh, yeah. And then SSDB page. And then I bet you two, until I set my streaming up, I could just use that. Right, so the fight itself. Um, I wanted to launch um, on the launch day for Apollo, um, but the wind was rubbish and that didn't work out. So um, I think this was on landing day then. So um, that was the prediction when I love these. <laughs> so when your prediction basically goes uh, back over your, where you launched, um, all you need to do is set the burst altitude so that it goes here instead of over here or over here. So I chose the right size balloon. Um, it's handy if you, I mean, I, Steve's, the, well, Steve's got 10 times as many balloons as I have, but I try and keep one of each size in stock. Uh, so on the morning of the launch, I can choose the right size balloon to get exactly what I want. Um, and, uh, and it actually landed uh, just a bit further up. So this was f uh, for a certain time in the morning, but I launched a few hours later, because very usefully, uh, someone, I won't name names, um, launched a balloon in the morning on the same frequency as one of my trackers. So I used the excuse to delay, but actually it, it was handy. It, it was stress-free if I just delayed things a few hours. Um, and then the payload was uh, a Pi and Pi in the Sky. I used a, a wide-angle uh, Pi camera because when you've got something this close, uh, you need a wide-angle lens to get it in. It was either that or a regular one and have it out there, uh, which is possible. Um, I used an SJ4000 video camera because I... I um, I did a test between that and some GoPros and some other cameras I had, and that was the one that was best for close focus. So action cameras, some of them are designed for, you know, when you jump off cliffs and things and do all that sort of uh, stupid sport, where it looks at your face and it gets, gets nice and sharp. Um, and the SJ was good for that. The problem is, focusing close, as I like me now, I can't see you a lot. <laughs> so um, the, the Pi camera is a bit of a compromise between close focus and distance focus. Um, and then I flew an ADR uh, tracker to back up the one. So that's the uh, payload there. Um, that was a last minute bit of tape because the top of that water wood was in view of the camera at that point. Um, and that's it there, pretty straightforward. Lots of pink tape. Even Steve's got pink, haven't you now? Yeah. Um, and that's the ADR backup. I like flying those because you put the battery in and it works. You don't have to worry about it. Like SD cards not plugged in or not booting or anything. Uh, oh, okay, right. So let's jump again a little bit, really. But um, uh, it, this is a fairly <coughs> hilly area, so I drove around the roads nearby and I found a place that was high enough that I hoped I would still get a, a signal when it landed, which I did. Um, and then tried to figure out a way of getting uh, from the road to where the uh, payload was. Um, and there was a track, but I didn't know who owned it, so I, I asked the, the local who sent me to the uh, 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 the offices for the, um, the uh, uh, people that owned all the land. And they very usefully printed me out a sheet with the, all the public footpaths. And um, that's the payload there. That's the public footpath all the way. Uh, 
down to the road and their offices were here. And I was um, earlier, I was I fear somewhere. I could have got actually most of the way up there in my car if they'd said <laughs> it's okay to drive <laughs> your 4x4 up the track, but uh, they didn't. So I had a fairly steep walk up that way. Um, I didn't get the signal until I was about here mm. because of the hills. So, uh, um, uh, and to track all I had was a phone with, I've um, uh, got LoRa receiver, which is basically a LoRa module uh, and uh, an Arduino uh, with a USB interface on it, plugged into the phone, and that's it, I just carry that. Oh, oh yeah, there we are, I was quite pleased. And amazingly, I mean, you can see in the grass there is quite long, that, it, that piece of also broke off the payload. Um, and it must have hit, this must have hit the ground first, but it's still in one piece. Um, and you look at those legs, I mean, that one's bent from where I, I broke it before. So I was quite pleased it, it didn't break. Um, right, so, last thing is the video. So, <coughs> um, at that point in the flight, I knew everything had worked apart from I had no idea about the uh, video camera. Um, and when I got home, I saw that. And now you know why you use carbon fiber, you can't see it. That's also the shadow. <laughs> can't get around that. You can't get around that. Yeah. And you can just, when it, if it eventually goes below the horizon, you'll see the, the force of it. There you go. <laughs> but otherwise. <coughs> cool. That's it. <laughs>
Um, I put RTTY on just to help because you get more people listening and it's a more interactive thing, so it's more fun for the people listening. Um, but for me in the car, I don't even turn the radio on for RTTY. Because you needed the gateways, really, didn't For this stuff, I needed the gateways, so yeah. yeah so I don't think I have to do RTTY at all this time. But, no. um, Law is much better in the, in the car because the amount of kit you need and the amount of maintenance it needs is much better. I mean, like I said, I've got a phone. Once it's, it's locked into the signal, it just works. And you could, I mean, I've, I've got a load. I mean, I could have, could have done a half hour talk just on the kit in the car. Um, but you can just, there's just a phone and the loyal receiver is all you need to go and track, track one of these from loops to uh, chasing and, and on foot. It was, um, it's a little um, Upu, uh, Upu Sonics guy, and, uh, Anthony. He um, he made some trackers a while back, and um, Steve was going to do a flight where uh, we we're going to um, launch a load of balloons at the same time. So I've got about ten of these, <laughs> and uh, um, and I just put it into that little egg, and I just attach it to basically every flight because it's fifth. Yeah, it might be less than thirty-five grams, I think it is. So you just <coughs> stick it in line, and it's an extra. Because stuff goes wrong, you know. Um, and if the track is working, the aerial can get ripped off. I've had that. Okay. All sorts of things go wrong. Another backup track is very unlikely to so do.